Hello everyone, I'm Chris Wynn and welcome to the Rocker Report podcast in association with Sunderland Community Soup Kitchen where we build up to our second League One fixture of the season. Uh, this time it's our first game on our travels after the weekend's 2-1 win over Wigan Athletic at the Stadium of Light as we take on MK Dons at Stadium MK. After they had a bit of a crazy opening day last week at Bolton, which I'm sure we'll hear all about. So to bring us up to speed with all the comings and goings of Milton Keynes, uh, we're very pleased to have the company of Liam Connolly from the MK1 podcast. Hello, Liam. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm not bad, thanks. Well, I'm tip-top after getting three points <laughs> against Wigan at the weekend. How are you keeping? Yeah, not too bad. I don't blame you for being in the way you do regarding uh, Wigan, the Wigan result. It was a great brilliant result for yourself. And uh, yeah, not too bad for yourself. Yeah, it's been an entertaining couple of weeks, to say the least. Yeah, it was, it was particularly pleasing at the weekend, obviously, to get one over... Max Power and Charlie Wyke and Jordan Jones and the other 50 ex Sunderland players or whatever <laughs> at Wigan Athletic. But but yeah, it was an enjoyable one. And I want to come back to your opening day because it was a bit, uh, like I said, it was a bit crazy, but it, it deserves a, a longer conversation in a bit. But I, I'm just assuming you're glad this season's back up and running. Yeah, so we, we were lucky to have the experience of going down to Bournemouth a week before everyone else. Mm. Uh, in terms of experience in the Carabao Cup game, admittedly it turned a bit toxic towards the end and the result wasn't the result we wanted. Mm. But uh, it, regardless, it was still good to get out on the away days again and see everyone you hadn't seen in absolutely donkeys. Mm. And um, yeah, get back to football basically. Yeah, we had that uh, we had that pleasure at the weekend of kind of feeling feeling normality which was which was a good thing but uh, but I mean just quickly a bit about you Liam and MK Dons um, you know obviously looking into it MK Dons you know you, you know fairly kind of recent history but it's the 18th season of uh, having MK Dons <laughs> under that name so in terms of following the club do you go all the way back to the beginning? Pretty much yeah um, I remember going to the hockey stadium and things like that when mm. Wimbledon FC first came over to Milton Keynes and I went to a few games during that period, um, but I officially like started adopting the club when it changed its name to Milton Keynes Dons. Um, and yeah, I had a, f- went for a few seasons at the Hockey Stadium and then obviously back to say MK and I've been a seed ticket holder for years and years. So yeah, it's been basically been the support of my local club uh, ever since then and uh, going home and away. Yeah. Well, actually, just, I mean, just quickly on that, I mean, 18 years as MK Dons being Milton Keynes team, I mean, now I suppose you're getting that first generation who were kind of born whilst the club existed, so they've known nothing else but Milton Keynes. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think I was six or seven when the move happened. Mm. Um, so, of course, I was, I was oblivious to the whole politics around, regarding it all and everything like that. So, I find it funny when, you know, certain <laughs> sections of supporters, you get it every single weekend. I'm sure we'll get it this weekend <laughs> as well. Like, I want you to support MK Dons, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> but, it's, you know, it's a football local team pretty much. And, yeah. um yeah, and the next generation of Dons fans uh, coming up now um, are going to have that same experience of supporting the local team and hopefully it'll be able to build on that. Yeah, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one as, as, as it goes on. But uh, I'm sure there'll be kind of fans now almost being have, having to be taught, you know, this is why we're getting this stick because they'll know nothing. Like you said, they'll know nothing about it. Well, that's the thing. I think because... Well, by the time the next generation of Don Hunts come out, we'll be the older ones sort of educating mm. them on how everything that's happened and why, you know, certain things happen. And I'm sure when we go to AS Wimbledon this season, it's going to be an interesting experience because, you know, it, in the majority of Don's fans' eyes, you know, MK um, Don's fans' eyes at least, you know, Plough Lane is where Milton Keynes or Wimbledon FC was and that's where we, we believe Wimbledon FC. So it's like going back to the spiritual home of your club, um, even though you're uh, well, well, it's so many miles away. Um, mm. So yeah, that that feature is also cause controversy, and um, mm. you know, it, it just is what it is. Yeah. Well, I mean, before we get on to recent events, um, I want to look at uh, I want to look at last season. Um, and you finished thirteenth last season, obviously under Russell Martin, who I'm sure is a character we'll come back to um, at some point in all this. But um, but I mean, how how was the feeling around the club finishing mid table last season? Because you kind of struggled the the season before that. I think you'd finished nineteenth the season before that. Yeah, that that first season we finished nineteenth was difficult because Russell Martin came in, uh, taking over Paul Tisdale, who uh, quite frankly wasn't a very good manager. I think most of <laughs> the fans are agreement with that. Um, and yeah, Russell Martin came in towards the end of the season, and we did play really well. We got some big results uh, against teams highest above us in the league. Um, so the second season is full of optimism. Russell Martin's first full season, and um, 
bar a slow start, we did really, really well. Um, you know, we spoke a lot on the podcast about being a playoff team for the last 30 games of the season because we were statistically. And we were in the top six pretty much the whole time. Um, it's just unfortunate that we had such a slow start. And the majority mm. was to do with you know, Russell Martin's play style, you know, playing out from the back, playing very high risk, high reward football. Um, that did cost us some games and he got a lot of slack towards the start, which I'm sure will happen at his new club now, um, where he's in the championship. Um, but, you know, we grew into the season and we finished well. And the hope was going into this season that that would be the same and would even challenge, you know, for the top six or even higher than that. Mm -hmm. um, and we've certainly got the players to do that. But, of course, with the uncertainty regarding who's actually going to manage this team at the moment, it's, um, it's a difficult situation to uh, sort of get a grasp on. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, I was looking at it thinking, you know, because, I mean, just if you look purely in terms of league position, six places higher. But I, what I was going to ask was, you know, because Russell Martin came out of it looking, you know, <laughs> having this reputation of after MK Dons finished 13th. But as you said, was, was it a real huge improvement? Was a complete shift, was it, last season? Because like six positions doesn't seem like much just on paper. Yeah, but well, the funny thing is that that whole area of the League One table was so close, even towards mm. the end. So we were, we were a couple of wins off of you know there was there was playoff talk like four or five games left of the season, and you know we we just fell off towards the end basically. But there was a genuine chance we could have been playoffs last season. Um, so I think that's where all that chatter came from. Mm. And you know I think the biggest achievement that Russell Martin did have was he brought the club back together. It was very disjointed after the League Two season. Paul Tisdale, quite frankly, was just almost ruined the fan base in terms of certain opinions regarding his play style. But what Russell did was, you know, he engaged with, you know, ourselves and other podcasts and did things with the fans that brought us together and understood his philosophies. And whether you believe those philosophies anymore as a Don's fan, is it's hard to because of what's happened. But I think the actual purpose of the what happened, you know, it worked and mm. I think that's why this season we were so optimistic of what was going to happen because we signed these really good players and arguably it was our biggest chance to win ever mm. um, in terms of the players were signed. So the first of the players are still there, but when the main man kind of leaves it and leaves mm. it for dead, it's a uh, it's difficult <laughs> one to take. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, again, just just quickly looking at last season because obviously from a Sunderland point of view, you had uh, Will Grigg on loan last season um and he was i mean going back way back to 2015 he was your top scorer when you got promoted to the to the championship as well but i mean last season he got eight and 20 appearances so, so how did he get on last season at mk dons yeah well we we'll get a lot of love for Keynes, that's for sure of course as you mentioned from the promotion seeds you know he was terrific in that and mm. yeah you know, there was there was definitely a feel of him having his hope coming i suppose come back to milton mm. Keynes on loan and uh, in the games he started, admittedly, the, the goal record doesn't look amazing for a striker who respect him scoring loads of goals, considering the wages he's on and the fees he went for. Mm -hmm. But I think when he started games, he actually played really, really well. I think in the first sort of three or four games, he had about four or five goal contributions, which in our system, our strikers aren't necessarily looking to score goals all the time. It's more about working hard for the team. And, you know, that's why I mentioned goal contributions over goals, because assists matter as much as that for the strikers. There's a link up play and everyone scoring goals rather than having, you know, like a Charlie White up front who's going to score 30 goals for you. Mm. So I think on the whole, he did really well. But I think what ultimately he wasn't worth paying X amount of money for for Russell Martin. And I think if you actually thought about it as a Milwaukee's Don's fans, it made sense because he's not going to be that striker that's going to project you up to the championship, unfortunately. And I think that's why Sunderland, you've know, you got, you got your Ross Stewart's and things like that who you know are going to start regularly now for Sunderland and I think really benefit from that yeah I mean were you were you disappointed that he didn't sign permanently in the summer was that um, ever on the cards I think it was at one point I think you know the, the Matt Martin was open to signing him but I think it had to be for the right deal and ultimately Sunderland want to get some sort of investment back don't they from Greg what they spent you know, millions of pounds on so um, <laughs> I think if you look at it now and say look we've got Mo Issa Troy Parrott uh, Charlie Brown, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't think you can really say you want Wilbrook as well. Um, mm. And I think some fans, if they do say that, are, are being a bit, you know, trying to case to the the twenty fourteen twenty fifteen Greg who was so good. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure it's a transfer fee we're looking for at the minute. It's, it's just trying to get wages <laughs> off the book. That's uh, that's the, the nightmare we've got. But uh, 
But yeah, I mean, let's go on to this summer. As you mentioned a few players there, but we'll go through the business you've done um, because, again, it was Russell Martin who brought those players in. Um, I suppose, I mean, I was looking through them. Moisa is the big one, I suppose. Um, looked like an undisclosed fee whenever I've tried to look it up. But uh, keep saying that you, you broke your, your transfer record and there were quite a few looking at Moisa in the summer. So was he one um, that the fans were kind of particularly pleased to get over the line? Yeah, I know one of my co-hosts on the podcast, Ross, is a big fan of Moisa. Um, and it's been rumoured. Funny enough, a lot of the players that we signed this summer, have, we've been trying to get since last summer. Also, like last, last January, sorry. Um, like Ethan Robson, Moisa uh, and a few others. But yeah, I say it's believed club record fee for Moisa. It's not official. Um, of course, mm. the official one is Kieran Agard from quite a while ago now. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think Moisa headlines... Really, really good transfer window for the Dons. Potentially the best ever, in my opinion, mm. in terms of quality brought in. You know, Mo Issa, as we saw at the weekend, scores goals. That's what you need in this level. Maybe not, you don't need you know, 20 plus goals, right? That many people seem to think you do, um, especially in our system where we create so many chances for our strikers and we've got such quality up there now. You know, if he, even if he scores 50, he's probably going to have a good season. So him getting off the mark straight away is really good. Yeah. Troy Parrott coming in from Spurs, um, you know. He's, his quality's there. He should have scored the weekend as well if it wasn't for a clearance <laughs> off the line. Um, had a tough time at Ipswich, been played out of position and injuries. So he's promising. Um, outside of that, Ethan Robson's an interesting one. Coming in from Blackpool, of course, was a part of that promotion-winning campaign last season and started for the pivot ahead of David Kasumi, who's unfortunately injured, which is lucky for you because um, cause he was excellent. Um, but Ethan did really well on Saturday and seemed to slot in and got some nice rave reviews from Don's fans. Um, but yeah, that, that only sort of is a portion of the business that's been done. But I think those three in particular have been excellent pieces of business from Russell Martin, um, who the next manager can utilise and hopefully uh, achieves its full potential. Yeah, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Ethan Robson because I think a few Sunderland fans will be watching him this year because he left us to go to Blackpool last season. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he was he was always one who who looked like he was going to make it, but for one reason or another, I mean, going back to kind of Chris Coleman, never seemed to get get his chance. But whenever he did, he always seemed tidy on the ball. Um, didn't kind of nothing spectacular, but uh, kind of was one of those midfield players who. Just kept th- things ticking over, but I mean, like you said, he started the the first game, and is that kind of the role he's playing for for yourself, for MK Don? Um, at the moment, yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, a lot of our midfielders, uh, like Kasimu, like Robson, like Josh McEachern, again, who they're quite, I said, they're quite tired players. Don't do too much, but they do their job well. Mm. And I think in that pivot role that we have, uh, within in the three midfielders, that role is basically what we need for our midfielder right there. Because we have two more advanced players in Twine and O'Reilly who, you know, are going to need that creative freedom going forward to, you know, create chances. And we saw with Twine on Saturday all about that. So, yeah, I think he fit, fits the system perfectly. And, um, yeah, I think he's been an excellent signing so far. And um, I'm assuming he'll start on Saturday. So it'll be interesting to see how he gets on against his former employers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be, be interesting to come up against him again. And Josh Martin as well was another one I was going to mention. He He seems like a a decent left winger from from Norwich on lawn as well. Yeah, it's very interesting to see where Josh Martin's going to play now because he was brought in for us from Russell Martin anyway to play as a wing back. And a lot of fans, including Gabe Sutton, mentioned to us that we, he doesn't think he's going to be wing back. But mm. we always we always saw, we know Russell Martin in the back of our hand and we knew he was going to play there because if he's looked at the squad, Josh Martin fit there perfectly. He's quite an explosive player, quite a technical player who can also get past a man. And we had Dan Ethan there last season, who of course has gone back to Russell Martin and Swansea now, or it's about mm-hmm. to anyway, if it's not official yet. But he emulates kind of what we need that wing back position. And admittedly, Tanai Watson is currently starting there for us. And I think Tanai Watson brings a bit more solidarity in that back line. He's a bit more stable. And I think Lewington, who's the current interim manager at the moment, appreciates that from our wing backs at least. So mm. I think Josh Martin's an excellent option off the bench right now. If the new gaffer could find a position that he suits well, I think he'll come into that starting eleven and excel. Quite frankly, yeah, yeah, he looks looks like a player him. But um, so now, I mean, we we finally come on to the to the Russell Martin uh, saga. Um, and and when I was reading about it, I, I can remember because obviously at the time I was kind of looking in and you know just you know, but I wasn't kind of seeing all the details. And when you kind of read up on it, you know, he, he was in 
in charge for the final friendly against uh, Tottenham on the 28th. Um, then three days later, the club released a statement confirming that Swansea had made an, an official approach as their man to replace Steve Cooper, um, which was the same day as your first game in the Carabao Cup against Bournemouth. Uh, but then I read he turned them down twice before that. Um, so, I mean, before that official club statement came out, were you confident that he was going to stay? Uh, yeah, I think, I think. well, all three of us on the podcast and a few people we spoke to closely, uh, we're, all, we're all pretty confident. Um, on Wednesday night, we kind of brushed off the rumours. We watched the team play against Spurs, as you mentioned, and mm. played quite well, to be fair. I think at the time, you know, the players were pretty confident he'd stay and they hadn't really heard too much about it. But as the days went on from that game, it got worse and worse. And I think Adina Winter came out and said after the Bournemouth match how, you know, they were finding out through social media and they were seeing like the sky bet odds going down and down and down. And then finally, on the Saturday morning before the game, Russell Martin speaks to the players said, oh, I might be off. And it's like, <laughs> and we, we were on the train down to Bournemouth Barry when this statement was released. So we... We had a little, we, of course, we, we kind of knew he was being approached by Swansea, but that statement kind of just confirmed it all. And mm. I think that's why it got so toxic in the Bournemouth game. There was like, you know, uh, fans shouting stuff at Russell Martin's family, which isn't condoned at all. Yeah. But at the same time, you've got to appreciate the situation, how the man said on Friday morning he was going to stay at the club for the long term. And literally, what, like six six hours later, goes this is arranging to go to Swansea and take his whole coach stuff with him. So it's really hard to say have good words for him when he's just come across as a bit of a hypocrite to be honest and a liar. And um, we said this on our own podcast that it's just a real shame because his team has so much potential and it still does to be honest. And I think the performance against Bolton on Saturday really justified that. If this team is gonna fight for, you know, what essentially are brought here for Russell might have recruited these players. Mm-hmm. And the new gaffer coming in is going to have a really good team on his hands. So we're going to fight at the top of the table and hopefully be alongside the likes of you know Ipswich, yourselves, and many other teams. Yeah, I mean that, that's what I couldn't understand because I read that statement on the club website and it was obvious the club weren't happy at all with with what was going on. They weren't happy with Swansea. I assume behind the scenes they weren't happy with Russell Martin either. And I, and I listened to to your podcast, you you guys talking about it and. Um, I mean, I heard you discussing whether Russell Martin should have been on the bench for that game. And I, I kind of found myself agreeing with you that the club should have just went, right, you, you pulled and Dean Lewington's taken over. Yeah, I mean, uh, our sports director, Liam Sweeting, came out and said that, you know, he, he's spoken to Russ and Russ pretty much, I'm assuming t- said what he said to the reporter that you heard regarding the approaches mm. in the fact that, you know, he turned them down where... For what we said in the podcast, though, it, that that was a lie. Like he just lied to him face to face. From my from my opinion, because there's no way that you're switching that quickly from wanting to take your kid on for the long term, and then packing up to Swansea and taking all your coach stuff with you. Um, yeah, it's it's a very sour situation. I'm sure if you if you go onto get on Twitter, it's still very sour to this day. Mm. And Swansea fans seem to think it's a gender against him. It's not. It's just Russell Martin, quite frankly. Um, and yeah, I think until the new gaffer comes in, it's going to be quite a lot like that right now in terms of the bitterness and, quite frankly, just the <laughs> annoyance and anger of many people, and including ourselves. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised reading it. I mean, and obviously that game, it ended up five nil to Bournemouth. I mean, was because I, I mean Bournemouth are you know looking to be top end of the championship, obviously, but um, was a lot of that score lying down to all the events that was kind of surrounding the game. Yeah, it was weird because the first half they came out and actually played all right. You know, we went one 0 down. David Brooks scored a really good goal on the half volley, but they played okay. They didn't play like the manager was saying, "I'm off." Basically, but they came out the second half and it was like it was like the gaffer basically packed his bags in front of them and said, "We're off after full time," and the players came out dejected and they just looked completely lost. And I think. Everyone in the stands could see that I travelled down to Bournemouth and that's what made the situation even worse because mm. the, the focus was taken off the game and it was towards the bench and, you know, the Bournemouth fans that, of course, were going to wind up the Dons fans because the, the stadium's so close and that's, things just sort of happen really in the way days. But, mm. um, yeah, and then things happened at, after full time where, you know, there was going on to the coaches and things like that. But, yeah, it, 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 was, it, was, it was a good day out, but at the same time, it, it just turned 
really toxic and uh, it's just a difficult situation to be in. Yeah, it, it, it happens quite easily. Um, but I mean, it, I remember at the time thinking thinking something like this, I'm about to say, and even reading back, you know, what what is it, nearly a fortnight later or whatever it is, um, I mean, on the move to Swansea, he's only had a season and a half as a manager. Um, and, you know, from my point of view, I just think it's one of these managers, you know, that where you see have a have a, kind of a, this fantastic season and his stock just goes through the roof and then suddenly he gets this fantastic job. I mean, is there more to it than that with Russell Martin? Because I'm, I'm kind of sitting here thinking, I'm not quite sure how he got, how he was such a, you know, why Swansea were desperate to get him. But obviously, you know better than I do. Well, they paid, I think it was £400,000 compensation, something like that for him. So they, mm. yeah, they clearly wanted him. I think during international breaks, when we played yourselves, for example, where we won at the stadium a lot, um, mm. that, that was a key weekend for it all because all the focus is on, you know, League One because the internationals weren't on. So they were on, but they weren't playing. Um, so we were on like you know, we were on like, international TV, and you know, it was quite easy to see the influence that Russell Martin was having on this. I you know our goalkeeper Andrew Fisher was basically playing right back for half the game, mm. and you know we played really well, and we got a win against a team who we weren't expected to beat, and I think that kind of projected it all, and obviously more eyes were on the team as the season went on, and you know it, it came down to the point where you know Steve Cooper left, as you said, left unexpectedly, I suppose. Um, but he was sort of something he didn't like at Swansea. He packed his bags and mm. I'd say that there was a lot of buzz regarding Russell Martin in a previous job. Um, mm. I think it's Bristol City, if I'm correct. And you know, he turned down straight away. He didn't see it. But I think I've got the appeal of Swansea over time. Um, I mentioned this, we spoke about it on our podcast, mm. the fact that you, know, you look at the Brendan Rodgers's, the Roberto Martinez, the mm. Graham Potter's most recently, there's a clear progression there from you know being a manager of a championship who you know wasn't you know was doing okay, but then managing the national team of Belgium or going to Brighton or going to Leicester and doing so well. So I get it into the fact that there's a there's a path to which he could get to the top of the game, which he really wants to be. But I do I do have a feeling if if Norwich come calling, he's gone. So <laughs> I, I, I warn Swansea fans now: if Norwich or City are going to come calling for him, he is gone in a heartbeat, and he's taking his coach with him like he did to us. Yeah, well, I mean, going on to probably the complete opposite end of the spectrum, um, Dean Lewington stepped in to become caretaker manager, and it's a yeah. good chance to to speak about Dean Lewington. Um, he's a youth player at Wimbledon, made his debut a couple of years before it became MK Dons, and he's been at the club seventeen years. Uh, played over eight hundred games for the club, which in the modern game is pretty ridiculous. Um, something actually, I'd, I'd be surprised if we saw again. So I mean, as club legends go, he must be at the very top for it for MK Dons. Yeah, he is. He is the one club man. I think um, mm. absolute legend. I don't have too much word. I think I don't think words justify how much he means to this club and a lot of people who had done a similar move to him in terms of going from the FC to MK Dons at that time, where you know it was quite a niche thing to do. And there's still people at the club to this day that have done that move and fans that support the club that have done that same move, but they're not quite as public as Dean Lewington because. Yeah, they're afraid of you know getting abused things like that and yeah he's an absolute legend and I found I found the pictures of him in the tracksuit on Saturday and the kind of bit weird <laughs> I'm used to seeing him in the MK Dons getting into the tracksuit on the sidelines this looks photoshopped to me um, but no it, it was brilliant and I think the team really fought for him on Saturday which is a really nice thing to see I think they all, they all like see him as a real leader and aspire to be like him uh, towards the end of their careers um, so yeah I think Hopefully they can carry that spirit onto Saturday against Sunderland in the season opener at home. Yeah, so so I mean, just taking all of that into account that you've just said, club hero, club legend, all of that sort of stuff, loved at the club, can't see anything, you know, bad about him. Is the part of you that's slightly worried if he takes the job permanently that it could end sour? I mean, to the the fact he's always said he isn't going to do that, uh, kind of writes it off for me. Mm. And this isn't just a one-time thing. He said this on many occasions, and he's, he's re- reiterated that to the sporting director who's leading in the charge to get the new manager. Um, I think I think secretly, Liam Sweeting would maybe want him to, to take it. I think it saves him a lot of time, for sure, and maybe a lot of money in terms of compensation, getting a new gaffer in if he can't get mm. one uh, from who's, who's a free agent, essentially. But um, no, listen, I don't think I don't think Dino wants to be a manager. Um, 
too fair. He, I mean, he's still he's still a really good player, even at his age and mm. the, it was the 18th season now, so it's stupid. So, yeah, he's got a few more years of him, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, just talking about who's going to get the job, I, I was looking then. Jordy Morris is the current favourite. Um, he's been out of work since Frank Lampard got the sack at Chelsea. Um, I saw John Terry in the betting. Uh, James McPeak um, was an odd one that I had to look up and he's at Dundee. He was in the... Stephen Bradley from Shamrock Rovers was in the betting. Um, so, I mean, have you got a preference? And, um, I mean, is that the is that the is is your preference going to be the same as what the club might come out with? Um, well, I mean, if you if you believe if you believe the papers, McPay, McPay, sorry, and Bradley are on the shortlist, and Jody mm. Morris has been contacted. I think uh, for my number one would be Jody Morris. I think he is what we need right now. I think he's got a proven track record of you know doing well with youth teams at the Chelsea twenty threes. He's got a relationship with Charlie Brown, who's one of our you know young prospects at the club, and I think he's going to do really well. Um, and you know, he's got EFL experience working under Frank Lampard with Derby and of course mm. Chelsea in the Premier League um, to somewhat success. You know he did well when uh, unfortunately felt the last hurdle against Villa, but I think he's what we need right now. I think Stephen Bradley makes a lot of sense in Champ from Tramrock Rover, as you mentioned. Um, very possession based. You know, had a really good past a couple of seasons with Shamrock Rovers. Um, so yeah, I like him. James at Pake's an interesting one. Obviously, he just lost six 0 to Celtic at the weekend. Um, <laughs> not sure if that's impacted uh, Liam Sweeting's thoughts on it all. Um, but I think the one clear thing that's been coming from the club is they're going to take their time and all, which is not really what you're here really when you're starting a season. You've got such a tough start. But I get I get the thought process. Um, Hopefully we'll get an update at some point this week before the game on Saturday. Um, but yeah, I think if I had to pick one, probably Jody Morris. Okay, well, well, I mean, just in terms of you taking your time though, because obviously there's there's three weeks left of the the transfer window, um, and if you're maybe going to do a bit more business, does the decision around the manager kind of you know affect any potential deals that you've got you know until they get someone in charge? I mean, we've we've, we've brought in so many players already. I think. I think if Mr. Russell Martin was still here, he maybe want to bring in one or two more. Mm. But at the end of the day, this squad is, in my opinion, a win now squad. I think it's ready to get that far in the league. Um, so I think a manager coming in will probably have to have the attitude of that this is your squad till January, mm. and then we'll we'll see where you are from there. Um, they they spent so much money on it. I think um, I just mentioned, you know, club believe club record fee on my wife, so and all the other trimmings as well. So. Yeah, I think signing players isn't isn't going to be a priority. Um, there's plenty of additions, and the squad's good enough right now. In terms of the expectation for for this season, you know, where is that now? Because obviously, did you have a different expectation before Russell Martin when you know everything was rosy? You were signing Moisa, pre season was going well. Suddenly, Russell Martin leaves. Everything's up in the air. You know, so where's your expectation for the season now? Yeah, I think I think pre. I think pre Russell Martin leaving, it was to finish in the top six. I think, well, as I said, I think the squad's win now. I think it's ready to do that. Um, I don't think Russell Martin leaving changes that too much. Mm. The, the, the big, the big decider of who comes in, basically. I think that's the big one. If it's mm. if it's Stephen Bradley, if it's a Jody Morris, then well, more, 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 so it's more Bradley. If, if Bradley comes in, I think the situation doesn't really change too much. You know, he's a proven winner, whether that be in Ireland or not. And his his um his style of football is what the club's been trading on the past eighteen months, so it's not too much of a change. I think that's why he's a favourite in the market, and it makes sense. Jody Morris is a bit of a different story, of course. First managerial role, really. That's not assistant manager. I think it's harsh expect him to finish top six straight away, but at the same time, his the squad's good enough to do well. <laughs> I think he he's a young squad. He's been managing young players. His you know his whole career pretty much. And excel with them at the same time. I think anything less than the thirty finish from last season would be a disappointment, quite frankly. Mm. Yeah, but I mean, it's still a it's still a gap that you've got to bridge, you know, from mid table. And as you said, the gap wasn't. It's not too much, maybe in points at last season, but having that consistency to 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 stay in the playoffs, it would have still been a big gap to bridge. Whoever it's going to be, I uh, I think for me personally, I think a lot of teams think their squads are good when they're actually not. Um, <laughs> I, well, we've got a few teams. Wigan, for example, uh, they're not a good team. I don't care if they sign Humphreys and White. They're, 
they're, they're just not going to blend together, in my opinion. Shrewsbury, <laughs> never raised hand for, they're not going to do well this year. Um, I've, I think I think teams like Burton will take a step up, but take a step up to the top six is interesting. Yeah. Um, and then you're looking at the same... I, said, I think Wickham did real this year. I think Sunderland have actually got rid of Deadwood, quite frankly, in terms of players they've got rid of. And I think they'll do well this year. Ipswich, of course, will do well because they spent shit of tons of money. Uh, apologies for wearing. Um, and I've heard worse on our podcast, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I think Charlton will do well. I think Charlton have got a good squad. And I, I trust their recruitment team and I trust the manager to do well. So outside of that, I don't see many better squads than ours. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not. I don't think I'm being biased there. I think mm. our squad's good enough to compete in the top six, and it just needs the right gaffer. Before we finish, I'm going to hold you for a League One prediction this year, so I'll I'll give you a couple of minutes to to mull that over. But uh, but I mean the the, the opening day uh, finally arrived. Uh, we talked about us against Wigan, um, and you had Bolton Wanderers away from home. Ended up uh, in a three three draw, um, and ended up uh, game of the day on Quest, which of course is the. The most important thing of all, as this some exactly. fans have learned. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> bit of an epic. You took the lead twice and you came from behind in the game as well. And uh, Bolton scored in the 95th minute. Um, I assume you're looking at it as two points dropped. Yeah, but I think at the same time, if you ask any Dons fan, you know, travelling up to Bolton, you get to see six goals and take them from the game. I think you'd be over the moon, to be honest. Um, mm. It's such a difficult week for everyone involved um, mm. that... I feel you know we just we got a point off just pure spirit and pure determination. Um, you know, Bolton are not no mugs this season. I think they'll be top half definitely. And mm. I've, I thought that before the game on Saturday. Um, they got a really good squad there. They kept it together pretty much. Signed some players who League One experience in Bakayoko, for example. Um, and yeah, I think they'll give everyone a tough game this year. Um, but yeah, it's quite funny, you know, because the guy who scored the third goal here on Boateng, he'd been frozen out essentially by Russell Martin. Um, didn't he get a squad number this season? Um, <laughs> and then Dee Linton brought him back in. And funny enough, Dee Linton also got frozen out by a previous manager in Robbie Nielsen. Um, <laughs> so he sort of shared that speech with him. So I had a little chat with him, said, You come back into the squad, gave him the very teen shirt, and he gets the uh, third goal in the 86th minute to, you know, at, at the time, win the game. But of course, you know, Baptiste got the weirdest equalising goal I've ever seen. Um, but yeah, it was a really good performance. Um, I think defensively, it I mean it wasn't great, but we have we have got off, I think our, our second choice goalkeeper in goal because uh, Fisher's uh, still training and not exactly match fit just yet. We're mm-hmm. hoping he's back Saturday. I think I'm expecting to be back Saturday. Um, but yeah, overall pretty happy with that. Um, some cracking goals in there. I'm sure you've seen if you've seen the highlights. Um, mm. And yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing the boys on Saturday for sure. Yeah, I'm not not sure my heart could put up with uh, a game like that. that, that weekend, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I was looking uh, at, at last season's games. You took uh, four points off us uh, last season, um, and your win at the Stadium of Light was actually Phil Parkinson's last as as manager. So we've got a lot to be grateful for uh, for MK Dons in that respect. Yeah, no worries. Um, drew twos each at Stadium MK, which was a good game. Uh, but this weekend, I was looking that the bookies have got us. Favourites eleven to ten take all three points. Um, uh, MK Dons are twelve to five to win at home, same as the draw. Um, but I mean, from an MK Dons point of view, is it just a case of it's a home game? So any home game you just expect, or you know, you think you should be winning that? Yeah, I, I, well, I don't win. Um, I think unlike previous seasons, I'm, I say I'm quite high on Sunderland this year in terms of where they'll finish. Um, as mm. I mentioned already, I think they've got into quite a lot of dead wood in terms of the squad and I think the squad they've got now is probably the best they've had since they got back into League One. Yeah, I mean, it's not really surprised it's in the favourites because we've got a bloody manager. Uh, we've got a coach at football staff either. Um, we'd, have to draft, we'd have to draft him Ray Lewington, for example, to help <laughs> Dean uh, coach the players. He's meant yeah. to be retiring. Yeah, I, I, honestly, if you give me a point now, I'd take it. Um, but listen, I think the Dons fans are going to get behind the team 100%. And of course, with the Sunderland fans, it's going to be quite a good crowd on Saturday. Um, so I think it'll be a good game. Um, I'll go, I think prediction-wise, I'll go 2-2. Um, so yeah, it'll be quite a nice game. I think I think uh, our strikers will get a bag for the goals and uh, yeah, be entertaining watch. Plenty of goals, good stuff. But uh, but I mean, in terms of Dean Lewington, how he's going to set up, um, has he carried everything across? I mean, you mentioned players there, one of the players he's brought back in. But I mean, in terms of how he's setting up, is he doing anything different? Has he brought his own ideas in? 
And well, I think the main thing has been that he's most the same apart from he's taking less risks with a goalkeeper. And that may be because it's the second choice goalkeeper and not Andrew Fisher who's first choice. Maybe that's mm. a thing we'll see on Saturday. Who knows? But I think Dean Lewington, you know, end of the day, his his team right now and he's to do what he wants. And I think he's never really been a big, big fan of, you know, paying little ticky tacker passes around the back. He, he'd rather just lump up field and <laughs> let the attacker players do the talking. Mm. And to be fair, to, to most football fans, that's how it should be. Um, but that's the main thing. It's still, it's a, it's a 3 4 one, two. Um, So it's two strikers up front, probably going to be Mo Issa and if fit, Max Waters, but if not, Troy Parrott. Um, and then Scott Twine will be in behind them. And then you have players like Ethan Robson and Matt O'Reilly operating behind Twine, being sort of free roaming. Uh, yeah, but it's still, it's still heavily possession based. It's still keeping it on the ground, playing attractive football. Uh, the MK way, as some people call it. Um, mm -hmm. But hey, it's going to be entertaining. I think, as much as we have chances going forward, we're going to give them going, give them going back. Um, mm. So yeah, I think it'll be up to who, which strike force can be more clinical on the day. Mm. So since you watch them, or you've watched them, you know, against Bournemouth, and and you watch them against Bolton, um, if we put you in Lee Johnson's shoes, I mean, what what would, what would your game plan be? Would you push right on onto you when you when you're in possession, or would it be kind of the standoff? What what would your game plan be? Oh. Because a lot, a lot of teams actually did high press on us, and mm. I think it worked because we were doing this, you know, ticky tack around the back, and our players were still getting used to it and things like that. And I think Sunderland away was the first time we really saw it in full effect. Mm. I think for me, I'd probably just use those Aiden McGee as much as possible. That's on the counter attacks, in creative spaces, in the mm. pocket, wherever, wherever. Just make the game for Aiden McGee. I think mm. he's the guy that's going to change the game for you. And, you know, I think all you would do is feed Ross Stewart. I think because mm. I think our defense has typically struggled against your know, big body centre forwards who you know, know where the goal is. And I think Ross Stewart, I'm not really classing his first six months other than this like his start. I'm classing it as now. I sort of see him as a summer signing because you know what, what, what happened before and the toxicity around it was. I don't really class it as that. And obviously, obviously he started off well against you know, that goal against Wigan. So yeah, I think if he can get the hold of. Probably Warren O'Hara in the centre of defence. Um, and yeah, it could be a difficult day for Sunderland. But yeah, I'd focus my plan to Lady McGeady for sure if I was Lee Johnson. Yeah, well, Ross Stewart came in with a hamstring injury as well. So he's, he's, oh, wow. it's about yeah. the first time we've seen him, I think, fully fit um, as it stands. But it'd be quite, I think it might, it might surprise you actually, because um, against Wigan, I think we played as much into his feet as we did um, in the air. Uh, he's, he's pretty good with his feet. He's quite positive. So um Okay. So he could he could surprise a few defenders who are maybe expecting some kind of launch diagonals into him and it doesn't. I'll have come, to but... send a message to Dean and raise let him know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, coming back, I mentioned earlier on. Let's uh, let's have a look in the League One kind of crystal ball. Um, you know, Sunderland outright favourite seven to four. You've got Ipswich just behind nine to four. Then you've got a bunch of teams: Sheffield Wednesday, Portsmouth, Rotherham, probably the just the kind of big clubs. Um, at the minute, you're you're tenth in the betting for promotion at eleven to two. Uh, would you say that's about right? Uh, yeah, right now, um, I think that could change. Obviously, depending on who's appointed manager, um, I think if it's a certain if it's a Morris or a Bradley, it goes up. If it's a if it's a McPake, which quite frankly, as many Don's fans want, it probably stays about the same or even goes down. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to say right now um, in terms of. I think temp's about right. I think we've gone up a few places since the last checked. That's probably could be signed, don't I? So Parrot, things like that. You know, it's they're quite they're quite key signings for a club that needed that strikers up front. Quite frankly, in terms of where we were looking at previously, um, but yeah, it seems about right. And the, the bookies are really wrong, guys. Let's face it. <laughs> well, at this point, it's worth bringing up um, that ahead of the season starting, we did our. League One predictions on the site um, and we did seven of us who did a full League One table um, and the average position across the seventh of us for MK Dons uh, was ninth. Um, okay. But but I will say that the range between the seven of us went from fourth to 14th which suggests we haven't really got a clue um, to be fair so who knows. <laughs> Any, anything, anything from within fourth to 14th. But yeah I mean who, who do you fancy to take the two automatic spots and, and, and maybe... Who do you fancy, fancy to sneak it through the playoffs this season? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be boring and say Wickham and Ipswich as the two automatics. Mm. Um, you know, Wickham, uh, you know, got new owners. Ainsworth's probably the best manager in the league. Um, and they've got some really good players. And I think that on Saturday they showed that in a pretty tough game, to be fair. So, yeah, I think Wickham will do well this year. We've been a fellow Buckingham Street team, it hurts to say. But, you know, <laughs> it's, it's hard to it's hard to underestimate their quality. As I said of Ipswich, it's kind of like an all-star team at the moment, isn't it? They've got Joe Pickett up front now, who knows the division on the back of his hand. Mm. Scott Fraser was one of the best midfielders in the league last year. He's already got off the mark for them. Um, and that's only the start of it in terms of the players they've got. In terms of playoffs, that's tough right now because there's a lot of teams yeah. I think could get in there. That's right. I do I do quite like Charlton. Um, I think Charlton are a solid team and I think it's about time they went up. I think Stockley's got a good season in them. I would I would expect Dons to be in and around the playoffs to be honest. So, but I don't I don't trust them in the playoffs. Um, <laughs> they, they never do well in the playoffs. So, um, yeah, I can't see it being this year now. Of course, with what's happened. But no, I'd say Wickham and Ipswich for the automatics, and then probably if I'd say now, probably Charlton for the uh, playoffs. Mm. Yeah, you, you're speaking to a Sunderland fan about not liking playoffs, so I think we'll we'll leave, <laughs> we'll leave the playoffs behind. Um, but the, I mean, obviously, that on Saturday um, back at uh, Stadium MK, uh, I imagine there's a bit of a buzz around the place. Everyone, everyone getting back. Yeah, I mean, obviously we were back against Spurs, but it wasn't really. It was a pre-season game. It doesn't really count. Um, there's a difference. So isn't yeah, it? exactly. There de- definitely is a difference. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice to get back to see everyone again. Um, People that I missed, obviously, against Bournemouth uh, and Bolton, which I couldn't unfortunately go to. Um, but, yeah, no, it's going to be a really good time and hopefully we get the results to match that. Um, and if not, uh, you know, decent atmosphere. A third you mentioned there, but you've got a ticket, yeah, for the for the game on Oh, Saturday. yeah. See, well, seat tickets meant to be coming on Wednesday, so we'll see about that. But, yeah, um, yeah. should be should be OK. Well, I hope Saturday's game is a good one. Um, we've had some good ones in recent years, like I said. I remember a bit of a... Little bit of a pitch invasion from the Sunderland fans when Lyndon Gooch scored a couple of years ago, which was uh, good goal to be fair. (laughs) But uh, but on that note, I just want to say thank you very much, Liam. Really enjoyed the chance to catch up and uh, obviously, except against us, all the best for the season ahead, mate. Yeah, same to you. Thank you very much. Cheers, Liam. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Keep a look out at Rocker Report for all the build up ahead of the game at MK Dons on Saturday and keep an eye out in all the usual places for the next pod. Uh, But from us, it's bye for now.